welcome to the special video edition of the Gen webinar series, brought to you live from studios in San Diego, California. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Today's webinar is entitled, Getting Better Western Results. Sponsored by Life Technologies, a Thermo Fisher scientific brand, this webinar has been designed to show how a new Western blot system can help you optimize protein separation, transfer, and detection versus traditional methods. Now you have access to convenient and cost-effective solutions that enable better Western results. Let's go live to the studio, and I'd like to introduce Kevin Lowitz, Senior Product Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Kevin, floor is all yours. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar on getting better Western results. We are pleased you have joined us and plan to discuss the Western blotting process, including some of the common issues we face, new technologies, and to provide expert advice. Hello, I'm Kevin Lowitz, a senior product manager here at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and we're excited to have some very special guests joining us today. To my left is my colleague, Dr. David Borden, an R&D staff scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, who brings a great deal of experience in the Western workflow works on next-gen amino assay tools for translational research, and he is also actively involved in our field-based scientist-to-scientist support initiative. Good morning, David. Good morning, Kevin. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks. In addition to David, we have two guest speakers who we are pleased to have on our panel. Our first guest is Katrina Linning, a research assistant and lab manager with the Lonstein Lab at Michigan State University. And our second panelist is Thomas Thompson, who is a staff scientist at Bayer Healthcare. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Katrina. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about your role or your approach when you're evaluating new products for your lab? Um, what I focus on is trying to be as efficient as possible with the best results that can be used for publication. Um, and so we know that what we're doing is valid and reproducible, which is a, a big factor along with the cost. Great, thank you. And Thomas, I understand you've been doing Western plotting for over 25 years. Maybe you could just briefly tell us some of the biggest changes you've seen during that time within the Western blotting workflow. Yeah, um, Kevin, the uh, Western blotting process uh, is a very laborious and time-consuming uh, protocol, and it's something that I've done numerous times. I've actually done up to 10 blots in one day, and it was a full 10-hour day. Um, it's just something that... You know, it takes so much time, and there's really nothing else that can get accomplished in the lab. It's very difficult to pull yourself away when you've got timers going off and you've got solutions to change. And, you know, it's just something that really uh, takes everything you have to, to, you know, do a good job consistently. Great. Thanks, Thomas. Well, before we get started, I just want to remind the audience that we'll be conducting a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So I invite you to submit your questions now during the presentation, and we'll do our very best to answer as many as possible at the end. All right, so let's dive in. Let's talk about Western blotting, which for over the past 30 years has become one of the most ubiquitous but also laborious techniques used by life science researchers, researchers globally. It's used to measure semi-quantitatively protein levels using size-based separation coupled with high affinity immune detection. And really for, for many of us doing Western blotting, it's all about the journey from going from a sample to an answer and really hopefully arriving at a result like you see there below on the, on the screen to advance our research. Fortunately, over the past 10 years or so, we've seen a lot of product innovation take place in this workflow. And it's really been focused on reducing the number of steps, reducing hands-on time, and overall time to result, and all with the goal of not trading off anything with, with regard to performance, such as sensitivity. So our aim is really to make this journey more efficient, deliver higher confidence, and frankly, just make it more fun. So with today's uh, presentation, what we'd like to do is highlight a few of the areas of the workflow. First, we'll talk about protein separation, and David will tell us a little bit about some simple steps to help improve the SDS page performance. Also talk about protein transfer, and some different methods or alternative methods to traditional blotting that could help reduce time, but also uh, not trading off anything in performance. And then we'll spend a majority of the time talking about protein detection, specifically immunoprocessing of blots. And what we are excited about is to talk to you about a new product, which we feel has really revolutionized the way we process blots to deliver better reproducibility and all using less antibody. So with that, um, we invite you uh, to take up our first poll question. 
Um, so the, the question is, how many Western blots do you typically run per month? 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 20, or more than 20? So we'll take a few moments for participants or audience members to submit their answers. And maybe while we're waiting for that, uh, maybe Katrina, I could ask you about your typical, or Thomas, sorry, yeah. uh, about your typical throughput with regard to Western blotting. Sure. Um, Kevin, I, I usually do somewhere between uh, 6 and 10 uh, Western blots per month. Um, it's, it doesn't seem like a lot because, um, you know, it's not a big number, but um, with all the other responsibilities that I have in the lab and, and the workflow that I'm trying to maintain on a regular basis uh, with, the, you know, the traditional Western blotting, this has really uh, consumed the majority of my time. So Great. Thank you. And I guess at this time we'll maybe push the, the results live and see... Uh, Great. Well, with that, um, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to the next portion of our presentation. With that, I'll trans transition it over to David. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. That was a great introduction. And, you know, we're really passionate about the Western workflow. And I, I think, you know, I'm a, a, a scientist at Thermo Fisher. We're working on next-gen immunoassays with translational researchers. But to this day, Western blotting is still a very powerful tool that I, it's not going to go away. And I think that size confirmation, uh, being able to get another dimension of of specificity, spe uh, specifically uh, the size of a protein, is something that won't go away. Oh, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and so what I've done here, uh, I just did a, a little uh, a cloud, uh, a word cloud, to kind of highlight some of the words that people associate with Western blotting. I mean, frankly, we've all, uh, you know, had a bad Western blot, and we say, oh, you know, darn it, um, it's degraded, or there's variability, you know, irregularity. There, some of them, the words, you know, you want the most... Uh, the most high quality, right? So everything from slanted gels or slanted bands to low resolution, the frowns, the smiles. You know, we all have these little words that we want to avoid, basically. We want, we want this word cloud to be a lot more positivity, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what we've really worked on. And let me start out by saying that, you know, I'm one R&D scientist, and a lot of the work that I'm talking about today was not developed by me. It was developed by a, a large team that includes uh, people at at the site uh, that Kevin and I are at, uh, but it's the result of many years of great work. And so we're here today just to give the highlights of it. But it's a great workflow, and it's something that we were very passionate about. We really want to see the delighters. We want to see our end users be very satisfied with how we meet those challenges. And so in the next slide here, what I'm going to start out with is saying, you know, it's like a house, right? I mean, a house is only as good as its foundation. If you have a bad foundation on a home, it, it's, it's going to fall down eventually. And it's sign of a cheesy uh, comparison, but it's true. Uh, because when you think about the Western workflow, if if 100% is where you want to be, you want to get the 100% the best result. If you lose 80% of that potential 100, if you lose 80, uh, let's say you lose 20% of that during the separation step. Let's say for some reason you get a, a bad resolution, a bad separation. The best you can get is 80%. So if you lose something during the first step in the process, the separation step, if you lose something there, you'll never get it back. And so that's why a good Western is not only about the detection step or the transfer, but first and foremost, great separation. And so on the left-hand side here, on the right-hand side is a, a picture, an example of a great gel run by one of my colleagues. And uh, on the left-hand side are just some, some things to, to consider, right? We all want that band sharpness, the resolution, the reproducibility. It starts with sample prep. Uh, many people still use that boiling for 10 minutes. You know, they boil their protein to get the denaturation. That's something that we don't think is necessary. So we have unique chemistries that allow us to denature the protein um, at 70 degrees for 10 minutes. So we think that that less harsh uh, denaturation is the first step to getting good uh, separation because you haven't degraded the protein even before it gets loaded on the gel. You don't want to degrade the protein first. Uh, so temperature and storage of the protein. If you're going to store the proteins in your loading buffer for more than a week, we need to, you need to freeze it. Don't just keep it at four degrees. Secondly is uh, gel selection. Of course, a lot of people still pour their own gels. And we've all know stories about, you know, you pour a 10-pack of gels in that 10-pack that system, and maybe two or three of those 10 are, are not good gels. I mean, they, they, you end up throwing them out and saying, okay, let me try this one instead. 
Well, there's a lot of waste there, and there's a lot of time uh, spent. And so going maybe a precast route is a great way to get every single gel performing the same way. And also the selection of the gel, whether it be, uh, let's say, a tris acetate gel for better separation, for example. You know, we'll talk about some of our new page chemistries, but uh, tris acetate is still a great option for people that want to separate proteins up into the four or 500 kilodalton range. And then finally, run conditions, uh, you know, the buffer and the voltage. Some people feel like, okay, if you run the gel super slow, it's going to be better. Not necessarily. It's all about selecting the right buffer conditions with the right voltage. So in some cases, like in our, in our bolt system, you can separate in 20 minutes. Uh, and so you get very high quality. In some cases, actually, and I think uh, Katrina, you'll talk a little bit more about this later, switching from MES buffer, MES, to MOPS buffer can really help improve uh, separation as well. So beyond separation, uh, the next step, transfer, is very important, obviously, just as, as important. And so making sure that that transfer step is an exact blueprint. All the protein gets transferred from the gel to that membrane, either PVDF or nitrocellulose, is very important. So the stack setup, of course, is, is critical. Um, but one reason why a lot of people get those wavy bands is not because the gel was run um, inappropriate or um, incorrectly. It's actually during the separation step where, or, or sorry, uh, during the transfer step. They're pushing down on the gel too hard and actually it's squeezing out the gel and now you've got wavy bands that are just the result of smashing down too hard. Now in some cases people want better transfer efficiencies. You can add antioxidant uh, to your buffer system uh, to get a better, more efficient transfer of high molecular weight protein. Proteins. In other cases, you can use a dry transfer system, and we've got a nice dry transfer system that really optimizes voltage and time. Uh, and that's the, the final point, uh, is being able to optimize those time and, and uh, temperatures. Um, and so on this next slide, what we see here is a comparison of transfer methods. A lot of, I mean, I remember my postdoc, I, I mean, man, if I could have shaved some time off my postdoc by running something that took... Uh, maybe seven minutes instead of running my transfers overnight in a cold room, uh, classed liquid transfer. I mean, I know I have colleagues out there laughing because, you know, we spent years uh, trying to perfect our Western workflow. Well, a lot of the products we're talking about today didn't exist. And so we were using classic methods, and you'll, we'll hear from our guest speakers that, you know, that involved an overnight transfer. It, it involved a multi-hour separation. You know, right now, you see in this slide, we can get it down to under uh, about 10 minutes. And it's amazing. On the bottom left side is just a picture of a, a separation we did. And then, of course, you want that transfer. You want 100% of the protein. You don't want to blow through the protein. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but on the right-hand side, bottom right, what I'm showing is, uh, or what we're showing is the rescuing of two additional bands by going with the dry transfer system we have, the Ibalot 2. Uh, so what you see here is we are actually able to detect more protein on the membrane. So we're actually able to uh, recover more, or actually that blueprint is as close to 100% as possible. So I guess uh, now back to Kevin for one more poll question before we continue. Great. Thanks, David. So with that, we'll, we'll pause in, uh, again and for one final poll question. What membrane size do you typically use for Western blot processing? So do you use minis, midi size blots, mini size blots, or do you cut your blots into strips, either horizontally or vertically? So take a few minutes here to submit your, your response, and maybe while we're waiting for uh, participants to submit their answer, Katrina, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the common formats of Western blots that you use in your lab. Well, our lab primarily uses the minis. Um, they're, they're very convenient, they're easy to store, they have long shelf lives, and we also take those, cut them into strips. And that allows us to do a lot of our, our test runs um, when we're piloting primary antibodies. Great. Okay, thank you. Maybe with that we'll, we'll push the results live and see what, uh, see what the respondents say. Looks like a majority of people, no surprise, are using uh, mini size blots, about two-thirds of people. And uh, next up, we have uh, midi size blots, and then a smaller portion of people cutting their ships either horizontally or vertically. Mm -hmm. So, interesting. Great. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, and now, what I'd like to just hand it back over to David, who will talk about the protein detection step in the workflow. Thanks, Kevin. And what you see here is, is uh, a video that um, I helped shoot uh, with our colleagues. And what we're showing here is the manual steps in a, in a Western. And I think, you know, some might look at it and say, wow, you're, you're poking fun at it. Well, we are kind of because it's so true to life uh, that, that 
dictation of your workflow by going back, revisiting the shaker table, doing large liquid transfers, having to adjust your timer, uh, being able, basically having to plan your whole day around that Western workflow. I think that's something that we can all say is, is unnecessary in this day and age. And I think it's something that we'll hear more about today. You know, mm-hmm. Katrina, mm-hmm. you, Thomas, um, both of you guys, uh, and something that you dreaded, right? Yes, yes. very much. And that's something that you really wanted to get away from that that uh, chaoticness of of having to do that. And so what we've done is is at Thermo Fisher, what we've designed is the first ever unique system. And I'll, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about this system uh, in just a minute. But it's basically a system that we developed. Uh, and again, it's the collective work of a lot of people over a, a number of years. And so. Um, we're very proud of it. I think it's something that, you know, in my scientist to scientist role, I go out, work with our sales force, meet a lot of end users, translational investigators. Even those people doing serum profiling still need to do Western blotting. And it's a product that, you know, we've talked about before, Kevin. It's one of those products you look at. And I think as a scientist, I look at it and think, wow, you know, why didn't I think of that? Uh, and I think we've gotten that same response from a lot of people. It's so easy, so simple. And so the iBind Western system is three things. In this picture on this slide you're seeing, it's the iBind device, it's the iBind cards, and the iBind solution kit. And so let me bring it out here so I've got just a quick uh, show and tell. And so this is the iBind Western system. Uh, and so basically it's a small device. It's, you know, it's battery free. It's electric free. Uh, it's basically a device that, uh, you can run many of them on your bench top. And so just for, to go into a little more detail about this, um, this is the iBind Western system. And so what we see here is a small device. What you do is you open the lid, um, and then you, whoops, excuse me, <laughs> you open the lid and we have these small consumables. And these consumables are just a, a plastic backed, uh, glass fiber, and then uh, there's a stack of filter paper on the end. So you place the iBind card into the device, pre-wet the card with five mils of, of uh, iBind solution, and then place your, and in this case I have a pretend membrane, um, you place that membrane protein side down in the region marked membrane. You use a roller that we provide to roll out any extra liquid, air bubbles, etc. You go ahead and close the lid, open this uh, reagent cover, and add two mils of primary, two mils of wash, two mils of secondary, six mils of wash, close the cover and walk away. And this is one of those things, again, we, we joke about it in the lab. I think there's a, a famous infomercial, uh, hopefully it's not a trademarked uh, comment, <laughs> but when they said set it and forget it. And it's one of those things that sounds a little cheesy, but it is that simple. And so it's one of those things that we're very proud of because as we'll hear from our guest speakers, it's something that allows you to get back to work. You don't want to become, you know, there's no artistry beyond, once you've learned how to do a Western blot, uh, you don't get anything out of continuing to do the Western blot. You get something out of the results. And again, Kevin brought up sample to answer. What you care about is the answer. Um, it's not as gratifying to go through this manual workflow time and time again. You want the answer. You want to get on with it. And so I think that's where we're really proud of this device. Um, and so the iBind Western system starts with the solution. The iBind solution kit is that one solution that you need for everything. So in the top part of the slide here, I'm showing that how easy it is to make the iBind solution up. It's basically a 5X uh, concentrated iBind solution. You basically do a, one, uh, a uh, 5X dilution. You add 300 microliters of additive, uh, quantity sufficient, bring it up to 30 mils with DI water and you're ready to go. That's enough iBind solution to do your complete workflow. Now that iBind solution, you say, well, what's it used for? Well, it's used for the blocking step, it's used for the primary and secondary antibody dilutions, and it's your wash. So it's a single solution that's used for everything. And that's part of the beauty is that the blocking is built in because of that. Um, In the next slide here, what I'd like to do is kind of walk through how the iBind uh, system works in a little more detail. And this is from uh, help of one of our, uh, Kyle, our, our chief engineer, who's working on, the, on the, uh, the program. He provided me these CAD drawings. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of step through the process to kind of reiterate what we just talked about. So the first thing you do is you go ahead and uh, open the iBind device, uh, go ahead and place the iBind card, and then go ahead and add five mils of iBind solution. You pre-wet the card in the area um, away from the stack of filter paper on the left-hand side. 
And so on top of that, then you add one additional mill of iodine solution in the area where you're going to eventually place the membrane. And so here, you've got a membrane, it drops down. You go ahead and roll out any extra liquid or air bubbles. The point is that you have great uh, connection or a great contact between the membrane face down and the, uh, and the iodine uh, card. And the next step, you go ahead and close the lid. Again, very easy. You close the lid, pop open the reagent cover, and again, add two mils of primary, two mils of wash, two mils of secondary, and six mils of wash. The key point here, and we're going to hear more from Katrina and Thomas about also, is that, again, it's only two mils of primary antibody at the same dilution that you would normally be using in a manual workflow. And a lot of people, I mean, I was doing standard uh, 10 mil in my former life before using iBind. I was using 10 mils of primary. And uh, clearly it's a 5x savings there. Everything is done sequentially in a very routine process. It's all controlled. Again, it's three hours walk away. It's, it's a great system. And so to go into a little more detail of how the, the physics behind it work, a lot of people say, well, how does it work? Where are the batteries? Where's the power? And that's something, again, you know, we reiterate, hey, uh, you know, I hold up the device and I'll say, there's no batteries. You, in fact, to wash the system, you can dunk it in DI water. I mean, you can, you can uh, take the whole thing for a swim. I mean, it's all <laughs> electric free um, and it's a beautiful system. And so just to kind of highlight the fluidics here, I've done a, a, Kyle did a cross section here. So what you can see is the sequential movement. So the membrane is in blue. Again, face uh, protein side down. And once you start loading the system, it begins to wick. First primary antibody, followed by two mils of wash, followed by two mils of secondary antibody, and then six mils of wash. And the whole process takes about three hours. It's a great system. And in fact, on this next slide, there are just some sample data. And a lot of people are concerned. In fact, it's a casein-based blocking solution. And the first question they have is, oh, this is not going to work with phosphoproteins. Well, yes, it will. Because uh, my R&D colleagues did an extensive panel of phospho-specific proteins, one of which is shown here, phospho-AKT. And on the left-hand side in panel A, we see phospho-AKT uh, performed on iBind, and then phospho-AKT uh, Western done manually. And then below that in C and D are CREB, uh, again with iBind and manual. And one thing you'll point out, one thing you'll notice as well, beyond being more reproducible and um, uh, less hands-on time, is the great sensitivity. In fact, we get superior uh, performance in terms of sensitivity in many assays. And many, many people who use this product have seen the same thing. Now, furthermore, and what uh, Thomas will talk about in just a minute, is he's using fluorescence detection. In fact, uh, a lot of people are now moving to multiplexed infrared fluorescence detection because you can do band normalization, you can, do, uh, you can look at your target of interest, as well as that uh, housekeeping gene. And so what we're showing here in these blots is phosphostat, again, another phosphoprotein, as well as C-June on two different channels using a competitor's infrared fluorescent antibody uh, on iBind or manual. And again, we have a unique iBind solution kit that's designed for fluorescence detection. We call it the iBind FD kit. Uh, and then below that in C and D, we're, we're showing the performance of our uh, AlexaFluor infrared fluorescent on iBind and again, manual. So again, all in all, it's a great system. It works well. Uh, a lot of people that I visit that I would visit them traditionally for uh, serum-based biomarker profiling, they still do Westerns in the lab. And then they say, well, I didn't know you could talk about that. And I say, well, absolutely. We got this great device. Um, and I think our, our guest speaker will talk more about how even our sales force is finding uh, a fit with all of our users. And with that, uh, I just wanted to wrap up by saying you know, these are the sort of the value props of the system. And I don't mean for this to be too, too sales pitchy, but I think I, I am proud of it. I think I'm proud of it uh, that our team developed it. And again, it gives superior reproducibility. Why? Every single blot is treated the same way. Increased sensitivity, we've seen that in the data, and there are many, many more examples of that out in the field. Uh, again, less antibody usage. The key here, I think, uh, Katrina, you're going to talk about is when you're looking at multiple, you'll do strips, let's say, and you're looking at optimizing conditions first. You don't want to burn through a lot of antibody. Absolutely. And then finally, reduce hands-on time. Thomas, you're going to talk about how multitasking, you know, this is something that, I, I mean, I think all of us here would have to plan our day around the Westerns, and especially if you're wanting to do five or more. Yeah. It comes back to that video. 
that video is so true to life that you would have to plan your day around revisiting the shaker. I remember excusing myself from lab meetings so I could go wash my blots. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. And so it's a great system, uh, and I'd like to uh, you know, give the opportunity for our speakers to talk more about it. And Katrina, uh, why don't you give us your story? Okay. Um, well, I am the research assistant and lab manager for Joseph Lonstein's lab in the neuroscience program at Michigan State University. And currently our lab is studying the neural and hormonal regulation of postpartum maternal and emotional behavior. And we're looking at TPH2, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in the synthesis of serotonin in specific areas of the brain, such as the medial preoptic area and the dorsal raphe, and how those changes in those levels are involved with maternal behavior and anxiety. And the primary method that we're using to, to detect this is through Western blotting. Um, with being a researcher and a lab manager, my time is limited. I'm stretched pretty thin. So ways to optimize my time was crucial. So our life technologies rep, Dan Letty, he came in and says, I have a wonderful product that I want you to try called the iBond. It's going to help make your world of Western a whole lot better. So in our lab, we had evolved from the standard protocol for Westerns to using a system with a super signal enhancer to the current system that we are implementing, which is with the iBind system. Now, for all three protocols, they're basically the same. We run a protein on a gel. It takes 30, 45 minutes. Um, then we transfer using the dry block system, which takes a total of 15 minutes, which saves a lot of time over your traditional all day to overnight. The big difference comes in at the next step. Um, traditional standard protocol is all day. Usually in an academic lab, you're running four to six blocks at a time. You do not have the availability to go and do anything else. Same thing with the super signal. It enhances our target but once again, a lot of time on the lab bench, even though that time was greatly reduced from the standard protocol, where the introduction of the eye bind you set up, you're using five times less antibody. And as you can see with the two previous protocols, you're using 20 microliters. With the eye bind, you're only using four. Same dilution, far less antibody, which saves a lot of money because antibodies come in 100 microliter quantities. So you can already tell that's a lot of blots going down the tube versus the eye bond where you can spread that out, do a lot of samples, and get a lot of results in a very short period of time. So we were very, very, very happy with that eye bind system. So looking at the results that we were getting, our standard protocol where we're using our 10% tris bis gels, I, I did a dilution using um, samples from the medial prefrontal cortex, and we decided to go with the 20 micrograms to run on the gel. Um, as you can see in that first plot, we have a lot of background. We have a lot of bands that are present. When we were using those samples, where in panel B, you can see we use cerebellum, the medial prefrontal cortex, and whole brain lysate, but we use the iBind Western detection system, is very clear. We don't have a lot of background. Uh, our band of interest is very distinct. We can see different levels of the amount of the TPH2 that's in the various regions, which is very important. We are punching very, very small areas of the brain. There is not a lot of protein. What we're looking for is in very low abundance. But in using the eye bind system, those um, signals are amplified and easy to see. Um, so when we first got the system from Dan, he brought an MES buffer. And as you can see, there was a little more background and not as good separation, but still very clear detection of our, our interest. So he switched us over to the MOPS. We got good separation, and I was able to use the Pierce Super Signal to enhance signals for proteins that are very low detection, still run them in the eye bind, and still get beautiful, beautiful results. So we were very, very happy with the whole process of going from all day to going from running our gels, transferring, running the eye bind system, and actually ending up with results all in one day, and actually being able to run a second set of blots. So we've increased our efficiency, we increased our accuracy, and we reduced the cost by five times what we were initially running with the standard blots. So it makes 
everyone happy. <laughs> it allows me to be more efficient in lab, to do more in lab, and still get good results that we can put into publication to say we are able to do this and we get fabulous results from it. And it's all thanks to the iBind. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, before I ask a question, I just re reminded me when you said, okay, you were using 20 microliters, now you're using mm -hmm. two. It just reminded me that in the previous slides, I was talking about two mils of antibody. That's the diluted antibody, right. but people look at it in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, how much stock antibody am I taking from the stock tube? Mm -hmm. Now it's five times less, or once diluted, before they might use 10 mils, now they're using two mils. Either way, no matter how you word it, it's the same net savings. So just to yes, clarify, yes. if anybody was saying, wait a second, he said two mils and now she's saying two microliters, yeah. where, where's the difference? <laughs> you were saying the same thing. So yes. uh, this is awesome, uh, great data. And I think uh, I can very much appreciate that you have very small samples very small. in rodent brain. You don't, mm -hmm. it's not like you have a lot, you don't have gram amounts of tissue to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's great to see that, that enhanced sensitivity. My next question, or my question would be, um, now that you can see more, a better detection uh, at lower detection or at lower tissue amounts, mm -hmm. uh, is this shaping how you pursue future model systems and how you're looking at these brain regions in your rodent system? Yes, um, when you're working with rodents, you get one try. Right. Um, so, and with this system, we're allowed to use smaller amounts of protein to load and run on gels. So we're able to analyze more. We're able to see more and detect more and able to look at more than one thing, which before you were very limited. You extract your protein, that's all you had. You had to run a large quantity in order for you to be able to detect your, your gene of interest. And now you can run a very small amount you can run multiple antibodies. You have much more to present on what's going on in that particular area of the brain. So it, it makes us more productive all the way around. Great. No, that, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Kev? Yeah, Katrina, thank you. This is really terrific. Um, so you talked about elements of performance. You mm -hmm. talked about the cost savings. You talked about the time savings. So you're realizing all of these benefits of the system. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe tell us, as a lab manager, since you're the one controlling a lot of these new products that come into your lab and get adopted, what was the single most influential factor for you when deciding on bringing in iBind full time? Uh, the biggest factor was the savings with the primary antibody. And anyone that runs Westerns, that is your biggest cost expense, is your antibodies. Um, antibodies will easily run you $400 for 100 microliters, and you get maybe 10 runs. Well, we've multiplied that by 10 for the amount of runs that you can actually get from out of that single tube. So it reduces the amount of money we're taking out of the grant, which gives the lab the availability to actually do more with the money that we have at our exposure. Great. Thank you, Katrina. Terrific. Well, now I'd like to turn it over to Thomas. And Thomas, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your role at Bayer and also sure. the impact that iBind's had on your research. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, many years that I've worked uh, with Bayer, uh, various parts of my career I have been uh, required to do Western blotting and of course I did the old traditional protocol which um, you know takes a tremendous amount of um, focus and time and uh, through the years um, I got pretty good at it and I would actually do up to 10 at, at one time which would be about an 8 to 10 hour day um, but uh, anyway you know, as, as things advance in science, uh, you see new equipment coming along, and um, uh, this item, that you, the eye bind, is something that I think the timing was really good for me personally. Um, also, I, I wanted to just, just step back here. Um, I work in a protein therapy group, and uh, we target the disease hemophilia, so we're working with a lot of clotting factors, uh, seven, eight, and nine. And it's really important, uh, what I'm doing now, I've been uh, transferred into a new group where a lot of protein expression is done, and I've been asked to analyze uh, small-scale transient transfection samples to see uh, which were the best candidates to scale up to 10-liter wave bag uh, format. Um, so anyway, what, what I am doing now is taking these samples, uh, first of all, when I was in the lab one day, uh, our um, uh, rep came in, uh, Jody Mershandani, told me that there was this new device that just came out, and I was really dreading about, you know, going back to the old uh, days of the old protocols of Western blotting, 
And she said, Tom, you've got to try this out because it's going to make a big difference in your, in your workflow. And I said, well, bring it in. I want it, I want it here yesterday. And so I started using it, and I tell you, it was very easy to set up the first time. The results were magnificent. I was very pleased with them. And it has allowed me to continue uh, my regular workflow, which is about 50% lab time and 50% administrative types of tasks. Um, and and this device is is becoming very popular in the lab where I work now. And so I start off with two of the devices, and that wasn't enough. So then I switched up to four because other researchers want to try it, and then they want to keep it. So I just you know we just keep buying more and more of them. Um, but anyway, it's made a it's made a huge impact for me personally. So nice. So here is a result of uh, one of my one of my Western blots that I did with the iBind. And you can see, first of all, it's pretty clean. There's uh, almost no background whatsoever. Uh, I used uh, the uh, IR fluorescence with this for detection. Um, and basically what we're looking at, at is supernatants and cell pellets. We're trying to determine whether or not our, our protein of interest is being secreted. And, and this is actually a blot where the researchers were looking at adding different vitamin K, uh, to a couple types of them, to the uh, cells during the transfection. And originally, when we started out, before we added vitamin K, we got absolutely nothing secreted in, in the supernatant. So every, all the, the uh, protein was held up in the uh, cell pellet. And so by adjusting with this uh, additive, we're able to start to get a secreted protein, and the group of uh, four on the left on the supernatant um, blot show with protein, uh, with vitamin K, and on the right, the, the next group of four there uh, on the supernatants uh, is without any vitamin K. So you can see there's a significant uh, improvement there, and you know this is just an optimization step, but people need to have uh, quick answers with this, and with the eye bind, I can set, uh, you know, and, and also I get samples at various times during the day. If I get them late in the day, I can still run the gel. I can get my results overnight because that's how I set it up to run overnight, and then in the next morning, then I do the imaging. And so we have, you know, kind of a real time uh, result to where the, to where the uh, researchers can make important decisions as to how they want to gear up and optimize the protein expression, and then they set, set this up to the wave uh, 10 liter scale. And this is uh, something that really helps the total workflow of the lab, and you know, it just helps improve just the, the dynamics of how everything works in the group that I'm in. So. Great. Thomas, thank you very much. Sure. Um, I have a question for you. It's really great um, hearing your, your experience with that. Obviously, you were the early adopter yes. uh, of, of the of the platform in, at your organization. Can you talk a little bit about how your experiences influenced your colleagues within your lab or adjacent lab? You talked about being a support uh, support function group for other labs. How has your experience influenced their perception of, a, of considering a product like this? Well, uh, just because it it, it uh, gives you a result so quickly, it's so easy to set up. You can multitask, as you know, working in a lab, you have several experiments going simultaneously, and by using the iBind, you're freed up to get those results that you need that are so critical to move these research proteins forward, and you are able to, um, you know, really keep the workflow going in the lab. And um, I think that once, well, a lot of the, the researchers that I work with now uh, are adopting the um, iBind to use in their wor workflow, and um, you know it's just something that the timing is perfect for me because I just recently got transferred into this group, and I was really dreading having to spend four or five hours, you know, babysitting um, the protocol of you know doing the standard Western blot. So. Great. This is great, Thomas. Uh, I wanted to ask one more question. Sure. I see that you're, and I think you started to, you know, you mentioned you're using infrared fluorescence detection. Correct. I think that's something that's very exciting moving forward. Uh, that now it looks like you're experimenting with it right now. You know, moving forward, a lot of people are using multiplexed uh, mm -hmm. westerns now to be able to detect uh, a protein of interest right. as well as a housekeeping gene. It looks like for this experiment, you were kind of using the the red channel uh, with your your uh, protein standards, yes. but is that something that you're going to be using? I can imagine in wave bag yes. therapeutic proteins, you want to know how your protein of interest that you'll be purifying, how that compares to protein load, uh, you know, uh, other 
uh, other markers or you know how it all compares with the protein of interest. Are you going to be using multiplexed more? Yes. Yeah. That, okay. the, the future plans are to uh, to in- incorporate that. Uh, and and most likely running a housekeeping gene like you know gap d eight something like that and nice. then, and then um, you know running those together yeah beautiful beautiful well I think this is you know it's it's been great to hear your two stories uh, and you know it's something that I think us as a team we're very excited about right I mean on this next slide I'm going to show our Western workflow uh, the Thermo Fisher uh, Western workflow now with separation and transfer you know separation 20 to 30 minutes a seven minute dry transfer using our iBlot system and then the iBind Western system a three hour detection the whole process can be done in, in under four hours I think uh, just to to digress for a second and say, you know, as I'm an R&D scientist, one key initiative that I'm a part of is our next-gen immunoassay platform development. And you look at a lot of Western technologies that have come out more recently. Um, they they have these uh, these promises that are, are very cool in certain ways, but boy, is it a, a big investment. And I think this is something where you know you were talking about uh, making sure to manage a budget. Uh, mm-hmm. I think both of you can attest to the, the research dollars only go so far. And so the cool thing about this is that, man, we're not telling you that you have to switch from your traditional um, gel chemistries, uh, a transfer system that is very inexpensive. Um, and even iBind itself is is inexpensive. The, the whole key here is that you get a under four-hour Western workflow sample to answer at a very low price point. And I'm, I'm putting on maybe I'm putting on my product manager hat for a second. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Uh, but but it is something I think even you know as we develop new products, what we don't want to do is be called out to say, oh, that is the coolest thing, but man, it's going to break the bank. And I think this is where our team did a beautiful job of saying, hey, you get great performance, but it's not going to break the bank. And that's something I'm proud of. So this four-hour workflow is something to be very proud of for us as a team. We enjoy working with end users like yourself. You know, Kevin, you mentioned scientists to scientists. It's something that people are finding all the time that I bind can be used in so many different areas. Uh, and so at the bottom of this slide, we just show some of our how-to videos that kind of give people more information. So if you want to know more about the workflow, how it can meet your needs, go to that, uh, that URL uh, and check out the, um, you know, those uh, training videos. Uh, but I just wanted to say thank you very much to the speakers. Kevin, thanks for having me. You know, uh, customers, we'll see you at the bench. Uh, but, yeah, I'm excited to uh, see what work uh, you come out with next, publications, yeah. et cetera. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, David. So before we move on to the question and answer session, I'd like to remind viewers that you can submit your questions right now, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the the webinar and the Q&A session. Uh, Before we do that, I'd like to thank Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News for the opportunity and invitation to speak with you today. And uh, at, at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be receiving a brief survey. So we appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to fill out the survey, tell us about your experience, and note you might need to unblock the pop-ups on your computer. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to viewer questions. So please submit them in. Okay, so um, at this time, we've got a question here. Uh, looks like from Corrine at UCSD. Um, can you modulate the, uh, the, the time or of exposure or incubation of the primary antibody on the iBind? For example, some antibodies are incubated only one hour while others are incubated overnight. Or does anyone want to tackle that one in particular? Uh, I can take that on. I think based on the, the fluidics uh, that we described there, there is not a way to dial on and off the speed of flow. But a great way to adjust is the concentration of the antibody. And so the key here is, you know, when people say, well, why can't I run it over? You can run it overnight, but it's not going to go any slower or faster. But I ask people, why would you run it overnight? Or why would you only run one hour? And they, the answer is usually, well, because of maybe a background issue or not enough signal. That can be adjusted very easily with the concentration of the antibody. What we what we found is that the flow rate in the card is ideal, uh, the the time it takes for that flow. And so, no, it's not something that you can adjust. But we don't think you'll need to. It's something that uh, actually by adjusting the concentration of the antibody uh, and keeping that same flow rate, you should be able to get uh, just as good or better results. Can I add to that? Good. Sure. Um, the images that I had up from our lab. Um, 
that particular antibody we always ran overnight at four degrees. But when we were introduced to the iBind, we did the simple three hour setup and we got even better detection than we did incubating at four degrees overnight with the same antibody. Wow. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. <laughs> Uh, here's another question we have um, from Gloria at Boston University. How does this work without some type of electrical contribution? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, David. It, it's it's uh, it's simple Magic. physics. <laughs> it's simple physics. Uh, you know, it's capillary action, uh, and so it's. And I think you know these these slides will be available or a, a replay. You can watch that that sequential movement again in the animation. It basically just wicks one after the other. And when you think about the physics behind it, why they don't mix, I mean, there's hydrostatic forces on each liquid pushing on the other. So in the area right below each well, um, each liquid is trying to wick out. Um, and the one that's closest to the wick, um, which is the primary antibody, goes first. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just simple capillary action. Great. And did you guys want to add anything mm -hmm. to that? I mean, I guess you've experienced the same yeah. thing. There's no batteries. No. Uh, you know, people ask us all the time, well, no. how do I wash it? Yeah. Yes. And I say, mm -hmm. get a tub of DI water <laughs> and just give it a dunk. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's really that simple. Yeah, Dave, when I first started mine, the first thing I did, I looked for where the batteries went on it. Yeah. And I couldn't find any place to put them. So, yeah. you know, then I read the directions, of course, and then I went ahead and set it up. And I was really amazed at how easy it is to set it up. I can do it in about 10 minutes without any, you know, any problem whatsoever, and uh, it just has helped my workflow out tremendously. Nice. Great. Uh, we have a lot of questions here, so we're doing our best to get through them. Our next one comes from Diane. Um, is it possible to load, load more than one membrane at a time to the eye bind, um, especially if both membranes require the same primary and secondary antibody? I can take that one. Um, unfortunately, at this time, so the eye bind that, that we have is uh, only accommodates one mini size blot right now. Um, but uh, we appreciate your feedback, and uh, hopefully, we can deliver something in the future that can address other other needs of blot blotting formats out there. Um, there's another question here around uh, the cost of eye bind from uh, Martin and. Uh, I guess for, for that one, I'd like to say, because we have a lot of participants from all over the world on this webinar, it, it does depend on which region you're in. So I'd encourage you to talk to your Life Technologies or Thermo Fisher Scientific Sales Rep. You can also visit our website uh, um, to, uh, to learn more. And, um, but, but we will say, as, a, as what you heard from Katrina and, and also from, uh, from Thomas and, and David, is that um, it is a very cost-effective system. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does get to the point where if you are realizing the savings on antibody, it, uh, it, it pays for itself, even, even with the, the, the running costs. I don't know if you, you both oh, yeah. can attest to that. No, I would, I would just like to uh, add that uh, I've cut the uh, use of primary antibody two and a half times, two and a half fold. And when I first got the bottle and I was going to you know, do a standard uh, Western protocol of my primary antibody, I thought, boy, I'm going to burn through this fast. And that's, there's another $400 right out the window. And now I'm using one microliter, actually, of my primary antibody mm -hmm. for detection. And I probably could pare that back a little bit, but you can't really measure much less than a microliter. So that's what I stick with. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Ashley at uh, Cytoskeleton, Inc. Is there a blocking step? With iBind, David. You know uh, what's funny is we say no, there is no extra blocking step. However, there is a blocking agent in there. It's a casein-based blocking solution that's part of the iBind solution. So there is an actually a blocking protein. Casein is in there, uh, but there is no uh, 30 to 60 minute pre-step that you know traditionally in a manual Western you'd do a, a blocking with BSA or mm -hmm. something you'd let that go for a while before you move on to your primary right. step so the key is it's just a simple quick dip uh, of the membrane in that iBind solution mm -hmm. and then load it up like Thomas you said yeah. you know it's a 10 minute setup yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know we've had we've had races in the lab like how quickly somebody can set up an iBind uh, and I mean we, we've been able to push the envelope even more and uh, yeah we laugh about that but we can set them up very quickly yeah. so yeah there isn't there is no blocking step per se okay great uh, we have another question here from Liliana 
is there a chance to test the system before we buy it? Um, so I can take that one. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. There, there is a demo. Um, you can demo an iBind if you want or for any of the products that you, you saw displayed in the workflow. I'd encourage you to reach out again to your Life Technologies or Thermo Fisher Scientific Sales Rep to, uh, to request that demo. But um, maybe on that topic, I don't know, uh, Thomas or Katrina, if you, either one of you want to comment on kind of your demo process again and how that worked for you. Yeah, sure. Um, I always uh, demo all these new instruments that come along, and you know I'm, I'm always looking for something that can help my workflow. And I talked to again Jody Merchandani, my uh, sales rep for uh, uh, Life Technologies, and um, she's always provided me things uh, within a day or two. It's amazing to me how quickly she ships stuff to me, and I, I you know, I set it up the first time in the lab, and I was I was hooked. Uh, I told her I want you to sell me one right now. I want to buy another one, and I just start, you know, keep on buying them because they're just so important to my workflow. So, yeah, very nice, great. Let's see. Um, so actually, here's another question, uh, Matt from Children's Hospital. How much time do you realistically save by using the iMind? Was it an hour? Was it the whole day? Um, I don't know, maybe Katrina, you want to talk yeah. about what you experienced with that? It is saving the whole day. Um, we went from basically dividing up the process into two days because it takes time to run the blots, the transfer to blots, and then the incubation step, especially with the primary antibody, for an hour to overnight, where the iBind allowed us to do everything in a day and still have real work time to actually run another experiment. That's the biggest thing because outside of experiments, I have general lab duties that I'm responsible for and accounts and everything else. And I'm able to actually focus on something else while the iBind is doing its thing, giving me the results that I need. So yes, it is It is definitely a huge time saver because personnel have to get paid and that's also money. So it's, it's, it's very important to make the most of the time that you have and iBind gave me that ability. Can I add one thing, Kevin? Sure. Because when you think about the, if, if, I mean, I can appreciate a skeptical view of it. I mean, we're all scientists, right? Yeah. We're not going to take it just for, oh, it's got to work. And I think it's great to get this testimony. And you think, oh, okay, it's only, you know, six washes. Uh, it, it, they're five minutes apart. How much time can that be? Yeah. It's not the individual five minutes a pop. It's all the downtime in between and having yes. to stop what you're doing, mm -hmm. walk down the hall if your office and your lab are separated. It's that downtime in between. And throughout the whole day, that breakup or that yeah. interruption all day long, even though each of those steps by themselves, if you add them up, you might say, hey, it's not that much longer. But it's all the interruptions, yes. right? Yes. And so the ability to just set that thing up, mm -hmm. walk away, and yeah. say, you know what? I'm not going to look at it for yeah. another three, three hours. hours. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and you get three yeah. hours back. Yeah. Versus, and I think that's where, you know, when you start thinking about it that way, I think that's when there's an aha moment. Yeah. People say, yeah. ah, okay, now I get it. And actually another point is your product hit Productivity goes up. Yeah. Yeah. Drastically. Maybe to follow up on that, uh, a related question from Joyce. Uh, can you start your iBind by the end of the day and then take it into the next day, into the morning? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that, yeah, you can run it overnight. It's going to run three hours. So if you start at, let's say, 8 o'clock, it's going to run 8, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11. It'll be done by 11. It's going to sit there from 11 until the next morning. Mm -hmm. But the point is that the membrane stays moist, the card is still moist, and then the next morning, I think, Thomas, yes. you were talking about, you can come in, and especially if you're using fluorescence detection, right. you just come into the lab, put that uh, yeah. membrane on the imager, and yeah. boom, you're done. Yeah, five minutes is usually what it takes me. Yeah. So, Great. Uh, we have another question here from... From Karen at the University of Missouri, um, I use a directly conjugated primary antibody. How can I still use iBind with that type of uh, <laughs> I will protocol? I will bring out my, and I hope the, the cameraman can help us out here just so. So uh, what I'm going to do is just show the device. But yes, you can, absolutely. We get that asked all the time. So what you would do, uh, and I'll try to be very quick about this, but what you do is the, um, the two mils of primary goes into well number one still, just like it always would. Now, instead of uh, adding a secondary, right, it's just you want to get onto the wash steps. Mm -hmm. The final wash step is six mils in well number four. So what you do in wells two, three, and four, which are three wells, mm -hmm. you take that six mils that would normally be a wash and you break it up across the three wells. So it's your two mils of primary with your floor four antibody, and then two wash, two wash, two wash, and you're done. And it actually runs shorter because 
overall there's less fluid going through the system, so it actually runs even faster. Yeah. So hope that that nice. clarifies nice. that. Very nice. Kevin, I saw one question about PVDF versus nitrocellulose. Yes. And very quickly, just to say, yes, it works equally well on both systems. Of course, you have to make sure that your PVDF is still activated. We've seen some people in the field, they're trying out iBind, they're like, oh, wow, this is cool. And when they take their PVDF off of the stack, they let the PVDF dry out because they're looking at the protocol and they're amazed. They're like, oh, wow, what, you know, what do I do next? And they're all excited. And during that excitement, they let their PVDF dry out. If that's the case, you just have to give it a quick dip in methanol to right. reactivate it. Uh, but yeah, it's equally good and uh, equally as uh, efficient in PVDF and nitrocellulose. Actually, we have another question related to that. Um, is it necessary to use a dry transfer uh, up front of iBind in order to use iBind? No. Okay. No. And in fact, that's the beauty of it. The, the beauty of keeping it modular is that, you know, if people are dead set on whatever gel chemistry they're using mm -hmm. and whatever transfer chemist or transfer technique they're using, iBind can still work for you. Uh, and now we, we feel that, you know, we've tried to make a suite of products that give you that four hour great performance, you know, the, the, what I was talking about with the foundation mm -hmm. of a house. We, we feel that the best results are going to be when you have the best separation, the best transfer, and then followed by the best detection. But no, you, you can use them separately. That's what's cool about it, is that if you can only afford the iBind and you're heavily invested in your previous instrumentation, you can still take advantage of iBind. Great. So, um, More questions on iBind. Um, so in, in the spirit of an open platform, you talked about doing chemiluminescent detection, fluorescent detection. Can you also do chromogenic detection or color metric with iBind? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. N no problem whatsoever. And people have even asked things like, okay, platform dependence or independence, can I strip and reprobe? Absolutely. I mean, those kinds of, uh, you would do the same thing for manual. You can strip your blot and then reprobe it again on iBind. Mm -hmm. Some of those things, yeah, you can definitely okay. continue doing it that way. Great. Um, another question around the antibody use. So we talked about using the same concentration of antibody as you do in a manual blot. Mm -hmm. um, is that guaranteed to work for every single antibody? You know, that's, that's funny because what we've said, I think early on, uh, we started out by saying, let's use the same number of molecules. Mm -hmm. And I think what early on what happened was we'd say, let's start out with the same number of molecules of antibody in the two mils as you would have in your traditional 10 mils. Mm -hmm. What happened was a vast majority of the people had too much signal. And they'd say, well, how do you reduce the signal? And the answer is, well, how would you do it for a manual Western? You back off on the antibody concentration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, you know, you can adjust it with the, with the concentration of antibody. Great. Um, this one, uh, maybe David or even Thomas, you talked about fluorescent detection and multiplexing. Question is, can I use two different secondary antibodies at the same time? So, for example, a housekeeping and my protein. Oh, secondary or primary, I think. Yeah, the key with, and I think this is very important, that the key with uh, infrared fluorescence, two-channel fluorescence, the beauty of that is that, you know, a lot of people have run, for many years, they've done band normalization with, let's say, a beta-actin or, mm -hmm. or a gap-DH as a housekeeping. But what they would have to do is cut horizontal strips. And the reason they did that is because they were using chemiluminescent. They didn't know the degree of cross-reactivity between their primaries. So mm -hmm. they, would, they would spatially separate them so that they didn't have to worry about any cross-reactivity. Now, Thomas, you were showing some fluorescent data today. You can imagine if you had cross-reactivity of, of your protein of interest mm -hmm. with GAP-DH. Yeah. You'd see an overlap of the red and green. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is you'd actually be able to detect the degree of cross-reactivity. So... With multiplexing, you can run as many combinations as you want because you can uh, colorimetrically or spectrally distinguish one signal from the other. And that's the beauty of using uh, fluorescence yeah. versus a uh, black and white. Mm -hmm. But I think each, each uh, system has its benefits. But I think we're really excited about, as we see more people use iBind and it's with the FD kit, mm -hmm. uh, it's exciting because it takes, it takes that traditional or that Western that was a monochromatic and now elevates it even yeah. more. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that covers most of the questions we received in. Um, so with that answer, I think we'll go ahead and conclude today's webinar and sign off. Thank you again to our panelists, David, okay. Katrina, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and have a good day. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.